Today is our healing service, and I started a series last week called The Faith Life. And today, not only is this going to be a healing service, but I'm going to be talking about how to stay healed and how to make sure that you don't, as often as others, get into a place where you need physical healing. All right, so there's several components that go on to be healed or to have or to get healing or to walk in supernatural health is a complex body of emotional, physical, and spiritual things happening, workings. And God wants you healed. More importantly, he wants you whole. So to be healed is to bring back wholeness. To walk in health means to walk whole, not to have anything go wrong. Jesus had 10 lepers come before him and he prayed for them and they were healed. And some have said, although I don't necessarily believe this, but some have said, well, they all walked away, but they were st still not, they were healed, but they weren't whole. And one came back, one out of the 10 came back and thanked Jesus. He goes, where are the other nine? And he prayed over him. And I believe many times that God doesn't want us just to be healed of things, but he wants us walking whole and not losing any of that time, any of the effort, any of the finances that it causes us to lose, the downtime it causes us to lose, the emotional weight that it causes us to lose, time over, money over, success over because we're sick, because something is going on in ourselves mentally or something's going on in us spiritually. Let's start out in Psalm 103 this morning, Psalm 103. And again, this is a healing service. When you want to say amen today, say amen. amen. Let God know that you're here, not just, the, not just the, our, our audience, but let God know that you're invested into this this morning because this is going to be life-saving to the majority of you. And I'm going to pray. Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we invoke your name over this service here today, over this healing service. What you've done in the past, you still do. And Father God, I thank you for that. And that this will be produced again in the hearts and the minds of the bodies out of those that are here today, those that are watching us on television and watching live and seeing any part of this into the future. And that it's not robbed from anyone, even for those that have never heard that healing was available for the Christian. And Father, I thank you for that now, and that I would speak out your marvelous truths according to the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen and amen. All right, Psalm 103, bless Yahweh, O my soul. By the way, that word L-O-R-D, you'll notice is all in capital letters in Psalm 103. This appears some 7,000 times be between the Old and the New Testament, and you want to make sure and understand that the L-O-R-D is not what's actually there in the original ancient Hebrew, biblical Hebrew. What is there is God's name, and his name is Yahweh, and that's on the front of my pulpit. So that's why I say Yahweh. It's not something I created. Uh, people have known this uh, for 3,500 years or more. Bless Yahweh, O my soul. And all that it is within me, bless his holy name. So we bless Yahweh's name. Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. All right? So there are benefits to being saved. There are benefits to being a Christian. There are benefits to serving God. Serving God is not the end all. We get our, we, we're saved, but you know, God don't give me anything. And so many Christians today, so many denominations today said, well, you're not supposed to expect anything back from God. Well, no, that's not what it says in Scripture. He says, and forget none of his benefits. There are benefits to being saved. There are benefits to walking in the freedom of that, that Jesus Christ brings us. Now look at what he does here in verse three. First of all, he pardons all your iniquities. What is an iniquity? Iniquity is the propensity to sin that many people are born with. You could call them family sins. You could call them family curses. You could call them learned sins or learned curses, learned behaviors. So you're, you're, you're a young boy, you're growing up in your house, and your dad drinks all the time, spends all of his money on Friday afternoon, comes home drunk, doesn't have any money for the family, and you're two years old, three years old, four years old, and you cannot repeat that because you can't drive the car. You can't spend the check. You're not working. 
You can't go to the bar. You're not old enough. But that propensity to sin is still there because it hasn't been cleaned out of your family line. So you get old enough, old enough, old enough, and you make a paycheck and you're 14 and you figure out how to get alcohol. You figure out how to how to spend all your money on a Friday afternoon. You come home, your parents said, where's all your money? And you don't have an answer because the answer, the truth would be something you might get disciplined for. And so that is an iniquity. It's the propensity to sin given the opportunity. He pardons all of our iniquities, which is different than sin. And iniquity is the propensity to sin given the all the op get everything lined up and you know you're going to go back and do that thing. He pardons all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. When have we ever heard that in the church? When is that being preached any longer? There are denominations and there are certain groups that talk about healing, but they, they, you know, they, if, if push come to shove, they'll send you to a doctor. If push comes to shove, they'll, they'll tell you to go for professional help rather than first praying for yourself and over yourself. Who heals all your diseases. Name the diseases. Name the different things that are out there that we know about today. If he heals all of them, you can name them and those are the diseases that he heals. He is not so small or so weak that he can't heal some brand new disease that's come down the pike. I remember uh, when uh, I first started teaching on healing and there was the Hong Kong flu and that I guess came from Hong Kong. Then there was the swine flu and then there was the Alaskan pipeline flu. I mean, there were so many different flus out there and I did, I, Kathy and I, we just decided that we were gonna pass on all the different flus no matter where the flu came from. Then there was Aver and bird flu and then there was some other flus and now we got some brand new flus that are given different names but he heals all of our diseases he brings us into a place where we're no longer broken and humiliated by being sick amen so healing forgiveness Compassion, a long, healthy life are ours if we know how to access them and I want to tell you something Healing in the body of Christ is not being me getting up here, sweating up a storm, wiping my brow, trying to get you excited over receiving your healing. It is an intellectual ascent. Now, I need to be excited because I am. I love to talk about healing all the time. A lot of people don't want to hear about it. And a lot of people don't even want to move to read their Bibles to find out what it says about healing. But God heals all your diseases if you choose to access that kind of power, and the only way you can access that power, because we're rational individuals, is to think rationally. If I tell you that something is available to you and your rational mind says, well, that's impossible, it's impossible for you because you have said it's impossible. But if you begin to rationalize it because you've heard enough of the scriptures, you've heard enough of the word, then after a while, your rational mind says, I can rationalize me being healed. I can rationalize me being prosperous. I can rationalize me being of sound mind and body. I can rationalize that. And when you can rationalize it, then you can receive it from God. Once you know it's possible, then you can turn around and open up the door to heaven again. And you can say, God, I want this thing in my life. Praise God. Now let's keep reading. Verse three again, who pardons all of your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. In other words, your life from the pit is more of a, it's more of a psychological thing. When, when you're down in the pit, you know that you're in the pit. I, I don't know if any of you have ever been in a pit before psychologically. Maybe, hello, can I hear an amen? Amen. You've all been in a pit psychologically. You may be going through a kind, kind of a trial even right now. Some of you right now are in a lot of fear about what's coming on the earth. That's a pit. And it's so much fear that it may be crippling you. That's a pit. He, he redeems our life from the pit. Not from the pit we're imagining, but from our imaginations about how big the pit is. And so he redeems our life. He redeems us psychologically from that pit. This is an intellectual ascent of something that you get. You get Who crowned you with loving kindness and compassion. God wants to crown you with loving kindness and compassion. Who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed as the eagle. In fact, I'd like to say this. He says it satisfies 
He, he gives you the word there satisfies tov, which means good. And the word years actually in the Hebrew is the word mouth. So he satisfies your mouth with good things so that your years are renewed as the eagles. One of the things that we're told about over in Mark chapter 16, that we're to go out and preach the gospel to all creation. And all those that hear and believe will be saved, and those that disbelieve will be condemned. And if they drink any deadly poison, it shall not harm them. If they drink any deadly poison, absorb any deadly poison, eat any deadly poison. So if he's going to fill our mouth with good things, that's not just speech and spiritual things, but it's filling us with even the right kinds of things. People come to me all the time, aren't you afraid of pesticides? Well, of course. Well, aren't you afraid of how they change the food thing? Well, I said, well, you know, I'm not paying a whole lot of attention to that. I got more important things to pay attention to, and that's getting people into heaven. Hello? Amen. But if you are paying attention to that, you know what I say? Go through the rituals that you got to go through. Wash your food, take vitamins, exercise. But in the end, you can't have a perfect food source every single meal. So what are you going to do? Believe God that God is going to purge any poisons from your system. That you're not, if you drink any deadly poison, it shall not harm thee. And that's a promise that we have in Christianity today. So I can, I can understand this. I can intellectually assent to this. If I come up, when I, when I get into a prayer mode, <laughs> when I get into a prayer mode, which is often, particularly when I'm praying over other people, as I'm going to do at the end of the service. I'm going to pray for everyone here. And before we do that, I'm going to pray for everyone that's watching on television and watching online. But when I get into a prayer mode, my brain shifts to, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you came from. I don't care if you're a friend of mine or an enemy of mine. I have had many enemies over the last 40 years come to me and say, I was getting sicker. I was getting sicker. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I needed to go to you and ask you to pray for me because I have belittled you behind your back. I have spoken evil. And this is long before I became a pastor. And people would come to me and they would show up at my business. They would show up at my home. They go knock on the door and said, you're supposed to pray for me. And many of these people were not people that were in denominations that needed or thought about prayer. And I didn't even know they were speaking evil against me or speaking against me. But they came to my door, they knocked, and one man came up to me. And he said, uh, the doctor said, I got 60 days to live. And I prayed to God and he said, go and apologize to Dave Gonzalez and then tell him you wanted prayer. That man lived for another 10 years. Excuse me, he lived for another six years. Another six years when the doctors only gave him 60 days. And he came back and told me he had gotten healed. He came back about a year later and said he had gotten healed. It's amazing how many times that I get into a, in a mode in my head because of experience and because of the word of God where I ignore the outside things. And sometimes there'll be people that'll come up and want prayer. And I'll, I'll think in my head, naturally, I don't want to pray for them. I don't like them. I don't want to pray for them because if I pray for them, they're going to get healed. And I might not like that because I'm so certain that they're going to get healed. Now, you've probably liked everyone and loved everyone in your life. So you're looking at me like, what's the pastor saying? I don't even understand that. The reality is, is that when you switch from natural mode to prayer mode, your brain should switch out and know immediately that what God is asking you to do to pray for yourself or to pray, particularly pray for somebody else, means that even if particularly those that you don't like, that if God is getting you into a position to pray for people that you don't like, it's probably because they're going to get healed. And the reason why you're thinking about the two opposites that are going on is because God wants to do a miracle in their life and maybe do a miracle in your mind. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Praise God. So not only is there healing, like we're finding out here, by coming into the presence of God, but there's healing of our mind by coming into the presence of God. How many people are tormented and tortured? People come to me and say, uh, Pastor, I'm on medication because I'm, you know, I'm bipolar. Well, what is bipolar? It might be demon possession, which Jesus deals with. And if it is 
demon possession. That means we cast out a demon and now you're singular polar. You don't have two poles anymore. You don't need medication anymore. And sometimes that medication will cause you to be bipolar. Get off the medication and by the will of God, by the direction of the Holy Spirit, not by my, my direction. I'm not your doctor. But you go to God and God will show you things to get off. My mother was uh, taking care of our children. Kathy and I went on a trip to Dallas. This was back about 15 years ago. So my mother, she's a short little French woman and feisty as anything. And uh, she would, I would come back and the kids would tell me who were taller than her, because we got eight kids, that she would stand up on a chair and get in their face and yell at them. She would bring up a chair and just start yelling at my children that were taller than her. And I came home, she's feisty thing. So my kids, I came home and my kids were all ordered and, and straight and they, they didn't get any slack the whole time, you know, we were gone for 10 days. So I come back home and the house is in order and my mother came up to me one Sunday morning we had just gotten back on a Saturday, Kathy and I, Sunday morning. The house is in order. The kitchen is in order. And she, she's going to go to church and then she's going to fly out. She's going to come to church with us. So she said, David, I hear you believe in healing. She goes, I've got arthritis and I'm in stage whatever. And I've taken six medications every day to get rid of just to, to put the arthritis so it's not really bad. She goes, I can't even walk up and down your stairs. So I said, okay, Ma, I'll pray for you. So I just stopped. We're eating breakfast. My tie's half on. Food's flying all around the kitchen with 10 people, 11 people being in there. And I pray over her. And she says, I think I'm healed. On the way to church, she goes, I think I'm healed. On the way home from church that day, she goes, David, I think I'm healed. Then she flies back home. And my father, who doesn't really believe in any of this stuff, he's a Christian, but and a good man, but he, he doesn't believe in any of this stuff. She secretly had to stop taking her six meds a day. And when she hadn't taken them for two weeks, he said to her, you're looking pretty good. That medication must really be working. And she responded and said, God healed me. Your son David prayed over me. Amen. And I've been not taking medications for two weeks. Well, my father exploded because he really believes in the medical industry and all the good that it can bring. And I'm not against that either. And he exploded. She goes, I'm not going back on that medication. I'm healed of arthritis to this day. Now, this is some 15 or 20 years later. She's still healed of arthritis. And she's 86 years old, right? 86 years old. Praise God. And these things happen. You can go into one mode where you're thinking, you're talking, and you're natural. And when all of a sudden now someone asks you for prayer, or all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says you need to pray over yourself, you should switch gears in your brain and know something. You have gone from the natural person to a supernatural person, which you are anyway. This is not mysticism. This is not goofy spirituality or goofy Christianity. This is not doing somersaults or standing on your head or, or working up a storm, praying over yourself. It can be the middle of the night and just simply go, in the name of Jesus, headache be gone. And it will be removed. You can pray over other people. So, well, I don't know. Maybe I better have the pastor pray over you. I'm, I'm not really sure I like you all that much. And you don't, you don't, of course, you don't tell people that. But in your mind, you're processing, I really don't like this neighbor of mine. And now they want me to pray for their finances. I don't like them. And they got two cars more than I have. And they're doing better than I'm doing. I don't really want to know if I want to pray for their finances. They look like they're doing better than me. And so jealousy gets in the way. The, the flesh gets in the way. And yet, if we know how to shift out of the natural into our supernatural self, which has always been there anyway, it's not like God is dumping something special on you. It's not like you're downloading something special. It's always been there. That creativity, that spirit, that the spirit of power is in you now to pray over yourself, to pray over other people. So healing or walking in supernatural health comes many different ways. In order for us to walk in supernatural health, there are some things that we have to do. I've had people come to me hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times since I started this ministry. And they go, Pastor, why am I not getting healed? That's a common question. Why am I not getting healed? Well, there's sometimes there's an answer that I can't give you. There are some things going on in the supernatural realm that I cannot see. There are things that God is processing for the benefit of that individual and maybe other individuals around them. There was a man that Jesus went and laid hands on and he healed. And he said, well, why was that man sick? And he said, for the glory of God. 
Why did Lazarus die for the, and, and get raised back up again? For the glory of God. There are some things that come upon the earth that brings glory to God that as we're going into them or we see someone else going into them, we wonder what is going on. They're good people, but maybe it's for the glory of God. And we can't see all those things. So some people ask, why aren't they getting healed? I remember years ago before we started the church, we were attending another church in the area. And I talked faith all the time. Faith, faith, faith. And I still do that today. I talk faith all the time. As a pastor, I have to have all the gospel preached to you so that you're getting every bit of the gospel and not just the faith part. But here's it. Many times people say, well, is it my faith? And I'll say back to them, you know what? It could be a combination of things. And that's what I want you to think about this morning. Your healing, you walking in supernatural health, or you getting your healing could be a combination of three, four, five, ten different things that are distinctly unique in the operation of a human being. And those are the things we're going to be trying to unlock here this morning. Let's go over to 3 John, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that in all respects... You may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. I'm going to read it again. Beloved, I pray that in all respects, all respects, how many respects? In all respects, that you may prosper and be in good health. And you could say, I'll put in an and there, and your soul prospers. Again, Beloved, I pray. By the way, that word pray there is not in the King James. In the King James, it's I wish. But that word in the Greek is not a wish. It's, a, it's not wishing upon a star. It's not wishing uh, that, oh, I wish that you know, things would get better for me. It's an actual prayer, an ascent of spiritual energy, bringing before the Father, our Father in heaven, a desire to see someone do something or get blessed in some way. So it's not just a wish. If it was a wish, we're not just wishing. Many people say, I wish I was healed. I wish I was a millionaire. I wish I was married. I wish that we had children. I wish that I had a better job. And they talk about their wishes. That's not the kind of wish that you see in the King James. That's not the kind of thing that's being said here. It's more of the Greek word is more leaning towards I bring before heaven a generalized prayer that I pray that in all respects that you may prosper. People have come to me repeatedly because someone got to them and said, well, I just don't believe in your prosperity message. It isn't a prosperity message. It is a entire human being message. It engulfs all of you. God invented money. There are people out there preaching right now this morning that man invented money in the Babylonian area. Wrong. Wrong. It says over in Genesis chapter two that the gold in that land was great. It was tov. And the gold was tov, and the gold was good. Why is God talking about gold in the creation event in Genesis chapter 2? Because God was the creator of the exchange of wealth. He is the one who came up with the idea. He is the one who sustained the idea. He's the one who matured the idea. Man didn't come up with that. We didn't come up with the idea of monetary exchange. We didn't come up with the idea of having babies. We didn't even come up with the idea of marriage. God came up with all those things. And if God made you, then he's interested in everything that you're concerned about. Amen. Amen. So, beloved, I pray that in all respects that you may prosper. How would you prosper in all respects? One of the ways to prosper is to, well, make sure that your health insurance covers anything that you've got going on. Maybe another way that you prosper is all your bills are, are at the lowest interest rate you could possibly get. Or maybe you don't have any loans at all. Maybe the one way to prosper is you've got an increase at work. Maybe one of the ways for you to prosper is you're not running up and losing all your money in your old age because of sickness or disease or illness because you're not on Medicare or Medicaid or something or not properly on it. Whatever it might be. Whatever it might be, I wish that you would prosper in all respects. So whatever that prosperity is, it might be prospering in the offspring of your body, which is one of the blessings of Deuteronomy 28, that we shall prosper in the offspring of our body, in the offspring of our beast, in the cattle of our land, and everything we put our hand to. 
You can't run away from that word prosperity and prosper because it's all over the Bible. God wants you to prosper and be in good health. And in fact, that word health there, uh, it says good health here in the English. In the Greek, it's one word and it is, it is emphatically concerning being in perfect moral order and perfect physical order. So it's referring to the mind and it's referring to the body, you being in spiritual order, intellectual order, psychological order, physical order. So it's saying good health here. So sometimes people say, uh, uh, Father, I, I just, I'm praying for my health today. And I want to say in English, when you say you're praying for your health, it's not a descriptive term. You could have bad health. So I'm praying for my health. What does that mean? So when I pray and whenever I hear other people pray, if I'm able to say anything, if I can speak in their life, I say good health, great health, excellent health, living health. I'll interrupt the prayer or I'll say afterwards or I'll repeat the prayer and I'll say, Father, I thank you for putting me in great health. I won't just say health. It's not descriptive enough. If I go to the store and say, I'd like, I, I'd like, a, I'd like a suit. You, what kind of a suit do you want? No, just a suit. You go to the car dealer and say, I want a car. What kind of car do you want? Well, just a car. You want a great car, good car? You want a lemon? What do you want? I don't care. If we go to God in that same fashion, which we don't go, we don't go to the store and say those things. We don't go to the car dealership and say those things. Then we shouldn't come to God and say that we want just something average. We shouldn't go to God and say, well, yeah, we know, really know you're, in, you're busy up in heaven. I, want, I just want health. Really, you can't add one more word in there that describes the health that you want. I want to be healed. I want to be whole. I want to be restored. And by the way, the word of God is full of restoration scriptures physically. Physically. And there's many of them. And many of them that I've relied on. Uh, Kathy and I, we talk about this all the time. I'd walk into just five, seven years ago, we'd walk into a box store in the area and we'd be walking around and I was walking, just, I couldn't walk. I, I would tell her, okay, I've gone, to, I've gone as far as the registers at the front of the store. I gotta go back out to the truck and sit down. I am in pain. And that went on for several years. And I kept going to God, I said, God, I want my healing. So finally he said, you need to change your diet. But it wasn't after, it was after I found some scriptures. And so, well, let's go there. Let's just hold our place there for a second. Let's go, let's go do some research. This intellectual ascent. Let's go to Psalm 92. In Psalm 92, starting in verse 12, it says this, the righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. All right, so I'm supposed to flourish. I'm righteous. Doesn't mean I'm perfect, just means I'm righteous. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Well, cedars grow pretty big. All right, so they, and in order to get big, they got to live long. All right, how many people want long life here this morning? Say, I want long life. Long life. Amen. You ought, to be more, you ought to be more excited than that. If someone came to me and said, do you want long life? You're darn right. You're darn tootin' I want long life. Amen. 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 What does is, what is not having long life means? It means that you're going to die young or get sick and you're going to run up all your bills and leave no money to your children or your family. But my Bible tells me a righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. How are you going to leave an inheritance if you don't have any money? Because, you, you know, people say, well, you know, some people say pull the plug. Other people say, no, I want to stay along. I just want to stay alive as long as possible so my grandkids don't get any money. That's wicked. My Bible tells me that a righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. That means when... God calls you home, there's a, a meeting with the attorney and the grandkids are sitting there licking their chops because they know their grandfather was righteous. There's something in that note for them. You betcha. They're, the will is going to say, and the grandkids get this. Come on, church. Amen. You ought to be excited over this stuff. This is real prosperity. Yeah. This is great stuff. This is real. You can intellectually assent to this. Look at this. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of Yahweh. They will flourish in the courts of our God. All right, what's the courts of our God? That's church. It's the sanctuary. They'll be, when you come in Sunday mornings, you should be flourishing, wearing good clothes, smelling good, 
taking one step closer to that razor in the morning, guys. Hello. Amen. Verse 14. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green. Right? So this is for old folks. Right? You're getting up and you, whatever old is to you. If old is 36 years old, then that's for you. You shall be full of sap and very green to declare that Yahweh is upright. He is my rock and there's no unrighteousness in him. What am I declaring this morning? That I'm healed and whole. That last week I ran six miles. This past week I ran three miles. I could get up tomorrow morning and run a mile and a half easy as anything. I couldn't do that five years ago. I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on the word of God. That's what the word of God does. Once you intellectually assent to it, then you can receive it. But if you don't know it, you can't receive it. It's foolishness to you if you don't have, if your logical mind doesn't know about these things. They will still yield. You know what yielding means? Give up fruit in their old age. On my farm, I was walking around and even on the church property here, we got some really old, old, old trees. And what was that tree? It wasn't a walnut tree. It wasn't an almond tree. Your mother identified that nut. Hickory. A hickory nut. We find hickory nuts all over the church property here. And these trees are old, old trees. You could say, well, a tree gets so old, then it stops producing fruit, which are the nuts in the fall. Falling off the tree. <laughs> God wants you to produce fruit. In your old age. All right? Even if you're a little nutty, it's still going to be good fruit. Praise God. Amen? Well, why not? Should a tree die at age 100? Should a tree die at age 150? And yet this illustration that we're being given here is to compare ourselves to the natural kingdom that we can produce good fruit just like the natural kingdom can produce good fruit in our old age. But we have to intellectually know it so God can do a work in our physical body. Because once we intellectually know it, that's called faith, that's called belief. Once we have faith in that belief system, then God can do the work inside of us. But there's a process going on. Back in 3 John verse 2, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health or great health just as your soul prospers or just as your, your soulish nature, your mind and your will and your emotions are getting more and more under control. I know plenty of people out there, I was one of them for years, didn't have my soul under control. Didn't have it under control. I love God. But then my soul would be out of control. I would drink too much. I would, if I died 40 years ago, I would have gone to heaven, but I would drink too much. I would be smoking dope. If someone got me a little bit ticked off, I didn't have a wick. It was just show a flame and I'd go off. And so my soul was bursting and my soul was not under control. So we want to have our soul as our soul prospers. As we get more, our, our mind, our will and our emotions get more and more in line with what God wants us to be. So he wants all these things. So healing is all these things. Healing in your finances. What happens if your finances aren't doing good? I hate some things in life. You want to hear what I hate? I hate anything that takes advantage of young people, of minorities, and of the uneducated. Anything that preys on those groups. And of course, the old age, the, 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 the widow, you could say, and the orphans. Anything that preys on young people. What are some of the things in our society today that prey on young people? It's not music. We can talk about music. I'll tell you what it is. All these places that say, you cash your check. All these other things that take advantage of people getting something now, rather than, I think the government ought to close them down. You know why? Because it preys on their inability to conceptualize how demonic that process is. And then it keeps them in debt for four years, five years, six years. Amen. And that also preys on minorities, those same organizations. Get it now, cash your check, get your future check today. And then they charge you $500 interest in the week for a $500 check the previous week. And you never pay them off. 
You might better be better off going to the mafia. You'd get better, get, get better terms. <laughs> Casinos take advantage of the weak. Casinos take, and I, we got a casino right down the street. People that come to this church work for the casino. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the concept of bondage. Anything that takes advantage of the weak. Anything. And I'm not talking even about drugs. Drugs is a different thing altogether. There are things that are, prey on people's intellect. Well, because you don't have an education, you don't know how damaging this can be to you. All these things. But a healed life gets out of those things. A healed life gets away from those things. A healed life somehow gets a miracle where those things are paid off. Because not being able to pay those off is bondage. It's not, it's financially and fiscally, it's not being whole. I've seen many, 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 many people, including my own children from time to time, get into, and I can talk about this freely because some of my children have been in trouble with these things. And they're not afraid to talk about it, and neither am I. But it preys on the young. It preys on the old. And I hate those things. Anything that takes advantage of people, any minority that is being taken advantage of in any way, and that goes for everything that might be taking advantage of all those groups. So, it's not wish. Satan wants to break your spirit with lack. He wants to break your spirit with sickness. He wants to break your spirit with soul torments. A lot of you right now are in torment in your soul concerning what's come upon the earth. My boss has said, my hospital has said, my, my employer has said, I've got to take the shot. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll tell you what you do. First of all, you believe God. Second of all, get rid of the fear. Third of all, recognize there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Come on, church. There's no condemnation. Do you know what it says over Mark chapter 16? If they drink any deadly poison, it shall not harm them. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. You intellectually assent to these things first before your faith rises up to receive them. Understand that if the devil can get you to continually worry, to put your life on hold for one more day or one more week, then the slightest little thing that he can bring your way will trip you up and you're going to sit back down. And I, I talk to too many people that say, and have been saying long before all this started, I just feel like my, my life is on hold until, and then they name that until, until I get my next job, until my spouse get, gets healed, until my child gets out of the hospital, until my kid turns one, or until my, my children get in school. I feel like my life is on hold. The only person putting your life on hold is you. It's not God. The devil is trying to get you to put your life on hold psychologically. But the reality is, if you go through one more minute, you just took your life off of hold. You may have not got anything accomplished that God wanted you to move in, but your life's not on hold. But psychologically, Satan can, can try to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, but I am come that you might have life. And have it more abundantly. So we get under the life system, but intellectually assent. This is so important. Why is it important to come to church or at least get online every single Sunday? Twice a week if you can. Then on top of that, read your Bible. So you get in the life cycle and get out of the death cycle. Because there is a death cycle for human beings. And Satan wants you there. You know how many people were told about this healing service? Maybe six or 7,000 people, minimum, in the last three or four days. I know mailings went out, emailings went out. Then I did other things to get people to know that there was a healing service. How many people want that life? A lot of people don't even believe in it. And a lot of people say, well, it's not that important. Yes, it is. Because you first, in order to get healed, you have to intellectually assent to what God wants to do in you. You have to come to the place where you know the word of God is telling you the truth. But if you don't know the word of God, if you don't know that it says you shall be full of sap and very green, 
We got leaves turning yellow on all of our trees right now. We got our vines that are almost completely yellow. Those leaves are withering. That is not what I want to be in my old age. It shouldn't be what you want to be in your old age. I do not like the jokes that everyone makes about getting old. I heard them all this week. It seems as I was preparing this message for a week, I heard jokes about getting old. I won't even repeat them to you. Some of them are really funny, but I won't repeat them. Because they're not for me. And they're not for you. And you might go out here and repeat them and make the mistake that I made by telling you the joke. Jokes are funny, but it's, if, if it becomes your reality, then that's your gospel. That's your word. That's your death cycle that you're entering into and you don't even know what's happening. Amen. 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 Let's go over to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. Psalm 1 verse 1. How blessed is the man. All right. Do you want to be blessed? Amen. Say, I want to be blessed. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. What is the counsel of the wicked? Nine out of ten news programs, and that's number one, and maybe even number ten because you don't rec recognize what's going wrong. The counsel of the wicked is anyone who's speaking against God but not doing it overtly. Nor stand in the path of sinners. Nor sit in the seat of scoffers. How many scoffers are out there about all kinds of things today. Well, you know, the Bible isn't real. Well, you know, Christianity isn't for today. Or people mocking Christianity, people mocking Christians, people mocking Christians that believe in healing. These are scoffers. People mocking Christians that believe in prosperity. People mocking Christians that believe that God acts anymore today. They think God used to be big. And now he's tiny. When God's the same God is, was, and ever shall be. God is the same today as he ever was. God has not grown smaller. God has not grown weaker. What has grown weaker is the mind of man in Christianity. Weak teaching. But God hasn't grown weaker. Verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, or his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh. The Torah means the teachings that's all it means there. That word law there, the word Torah is really the Hebrew. And Torah simply means the teachings of Moses. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh. And in his law or in his teaching, he meditates day and night. Right? So we, we learn the word of God day and night. If we're going to get healed, if we're going to walk a healed life, we walk day and night in it. Right? What do we do? We're watching television at night. Talk about it. You're at a party, talk about it. You're sitting with someone at a restaurant, talk about it. Just bring it up, day and night. So, oh, Pastor, I'm having a good time. Talk about it anyway. You can talk about God when you're having a good time. When did he get eliminated from fun? Amen. 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 He will be like a tree. Here it is again. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water. Now, I have a creek. I have a stream running through our property. For those of you who have been on our property, it's a cool little stream and creek. It runs for quite a ways. It meanders, turns. And we've got willow trees and apple trees and other kinds of trees, oak trees, fruit trees, right on the creek. You know what they do? They lean away and their roots are going right down into that creek and they go deep down, tap roots going deep down. But even when it's dry out, that crick is still running. Even when the grass is burning up, the, that crick is still running. And those trees are the greenest thing. They're the greenest things around. You see any crick a long way off, particularly if it's really, really been dry out for a month. And you can see where the creek is. You can see where the river is. That's what is being talked about here. Even when it's dry for everybody else. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water. How do you like to be green all the time? Because you're planted in the right ground, at the right place, in the right time, no matter what's happening around you. And this is the healed life. This is how to make sure you stay healed. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. A lot of withering going on out there. 
A lot of people getting all afraid. Our leaf does not wither. Our leaf doesn't even shake. We're not nervous about tomorrow. We have to do what we need to do to support our family. Do what it takes. But understand, God is greater than what man can bring on the earth. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, there it is again, he prospers. There's that word prosperity again. This is in the first Psalm, the third verse. That whatever you do, if you pay, if you get away from the scoffers, get away from those people drawing you away. A woman came to me 20 years ago. She was, she ended up being a really good member of our church. She ended up staying in our church until she moved for 15 years. And her and her husband came in. They had been living together for 20 years. I said, don't you think it's time you got married? They had seven children. I said, okay, pastor, all right, if you say so. They got, they got, they got hooked up. They kept coming to church, but she was a drug addict. And there would be times it would just come back on her. So one Sunday afternoon, I really cared about her. One Sunday afternoon, I called her up at her home. And I said, where have you been? Why weren't you here? I said, I, read, I, I wrote a message just for you. In fact, you were on my mind by the Holy Spirit when I put this thing together. What kept you away? She said, Pastor, I was so hungover and I was so doped up, I didn't want to come in. I said, next time you're that doped up, you crawl into the church on your hands and knees and sleep in the back row if you got to come, but you make it in here to hear the Word of God. Amen. Now, she couldn't have heard us back then. She didn't have a TV and she couldn't have heard us on the Internet, not at that time. We make excuses why we can't sit in the house of God. Well, you know, I, I don't have the right dress to wear. Really? Had it last night when you were out dancing. Well, you know, I just don't have enough gas in my car. Well, you had it enough to get to the bar yesterday afternoon. Well, I just don't have any money to give, and I know how much you just really insist on everyone giving, and I didn't want to embarrass myself. Well, you had enough beer last night. You must have had something left over from that. Am I preaching to you now? Some people don't want to hear what I'm saying. If you're one of those people, say amen. <laughs> but this is real. If we're going to have a healed life, it has to be purposely. You have to purposely be healed. I hit 65 years of age. When I was younger, I didn't really think I was going to live all that long. I was a wild donkey of a man. I was aggressive. It was by the grace of God that I'm alive today. Not only did I try to kill myself, not intentionally, but just through this stupid actions. But then the devil was trying to kill me. Didn't want me to become a preacher. I know it now. And I'm alive today by the grace of God. But I remember when God began to show me that there was a call in my life. I knew I had to purposely start living for him. I couldn't just say, well, I'll just do whatever I feel like doing. I had to make a purpose and say, I'm going to serve God. I don't know what that means because I don't know where this is going. I didn't know I was going to become a preacher or even a, even a teacher of the word. But I'm going to purpose in my heart to go to church. I'm going to purpose in my heart to give money. I'm going to purpose in my heart to read my Bible. I'm going to purpose in my heart to at least try some of the things I read about. I'm going to try to pray over myself. I'm going to try to believe God. I'm going to try to be full of faith. You have to purpose in your heart. If you don't purpose in your heart, then the devil will put a purpose in your heart. And it'll always be negative. And you always make an excuse. And you always have a reason not to try. You always have a reason to hop up and go to the medicine cabinet at 1 a.m. in the morning rather than just lie in bed and lay your hands on your forehead and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Or on your gut, in the name of Jesus, be healed. You always have a reason not to pray over someone else. Well, you know, hang on here. Why don't you come with church with me five days from now and my, my pastor can pray over you. You pray over them. They asked you to do it. You do it. 
Stop making excuses to be used of God. Stop making excuses. You have to be purposeful in your decision to live long. You can't just arbitrarily do it. There are people out there that arbitrarily live their life like they're going to die tomorrow. And they're arbitrary about it. When we purposely live for God, then we, God puts a plan in our mind that actually raises us up and he begins to use us in the way that he wants us to be used. But you have to be purposeful about it. If you don't purposely decide to live for God, what do you have to live for? What do you have to get up for in the morning? If you have a goal, if you have goals for yourself, you'll get up in the morning, your feet will hit the ground running. And you'll go, this is another great day to be alive. But if you don't have a goal for your life and you say, well, I just think the pastor is being mean by telling me to have a goal. I'm not being mean. The devil's being mean to trick you into thinking you don't need a goal for your life. That's demonic. Everyone's got a call in their life. Every single person, no matter the circumstances of your birth, God has a plan for your life. Every one of you. And it's a great plan. I don't even know how long I've been preaching. I'm going to give you a few things. I was going to give you 10 things to make sure that you walk a healed life. I'll probably give you those next week, but I'll give you a couple things right now. Let's go over to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And when they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them. All right, so there's a crowd of people around the disciples. And some scribes arguing with them. All right. Who are the scribes arguing with the disciples? They are the scoffers. They're saying, listen, we're religious, not you. You guys aren't even educated in the word. And we're telling you that this healing thing, it don't work. And so the scribes are trying to bring everyone down with their unbelief. Verse 15, immediately when the entire crowd saw him, right? So Jesus is just showing up. They were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. And he answered and said to them, oh, unbelieving generation, how much long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. And when he saw him immediately, the spirit threw him into a convulsion, falling on the ground. He began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, if you can, if you can, I can see Jesus saying this. What do you mean, if you can? All things are possible to him who believes. All things are possible. 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 All, I said all things are possible. Jesus said all things are possible. All things are possible for our government. All things are possible for America. All things are possible for your marriage. All things are possible for your children. All things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. When I got a hold of that, when I got a hold of that, when I started seeing that, I began making declarations. Someday I'm going to be a millionaire. Someday I'm going to have a lot of kids. I began making declarations. I didn't even know what I was doing. But if all things are possible, I might as well start saying them right now. Amen. Jesus said you're supposed to speak unto that mountain. A lot, what a lot of people do is they speak to the mountain. They say, mountain, get bigger. I want that mountain of debt to get bigger. I want my problems in my life to get bigger. I want my sickness to get bigger. They repeat what the doctor said over and over. They repeat what the banker said and the accountant said over and over. They don't say, I'm debt free. Almost every morning, Kathy and I pray for this congregation. Do you know one of the things we pray almost every morning for you, for all those that are watching on TV and watching live? We pray almost every morning that our congregation is debt free. 
that you find money in your in your taxes, that you find money in your home, that you find money buried, that money just comes back to you, that things come back to you, that you find money in your clothing, that you find so much money you get debt free and that you stay debt free and then your children are debt free. And then I pray, we pray that we find money in our state, the state of Wisconsin. And then we say we find that every state finds money in their state, that they have ore, they have iron, they have diamonds, they have gold coming out of the ground. They have things coming in that they never found before. You believe that inheritance works? I believe that inheritance works. And I know in my family line, because the devil has robbed me, because the devil has always been out there, I know the devil stole from my family line and probably stole from yours. When the, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they had been slaves for almost 400 years. Not really quite 400, but they had been in Egypt for 400 years. And they came out with silver and gold, and there was not one, one ill or illness amongst their tribes. Five million men plus babies plus wives and they came out and they despoiled the Egyptians. They took all their silver and their gold articles. They took everything. The Egyptians were despoiled. Know what I pray every morning for you all, almost every morning, that you get back 400 years of back wages. 400 years. No matter who stole it from you, someone got free labor off of you, you get that back. This generation, not the next one. So well, that's kind of crazy, Pastor. Yeah, well, the Israelites got 400 years of back wages and they got it in one day. I'm just saying that you can get it in a month or get it this year. I'm not pressing it down to one day. I'm not being unreasonable with God. The money, you'll get money back in your taxes. Your truck will sell for 10 grand more than what you bought it for after you had it for five years. And by the way, that's happening in this church. Amen. That your house won't go underwater. It'll go so above water that you can own it for a year and sell it for 100 grand more. Amen. That's happening to people. Amen. Why would be making declarations? Amen. Let's everyone stand. This is a healing service. And we're going to pray for everyone at home. And I'm going to just, we're going to do confessions first. Amen. Say, I'm the head I'm and not the tail. Not the tail. I'm, above I'm above and not beneath. And not beneath. I, receive I receive 400 years, 400 years of back wages. Back wages. I am debt free. I am debt -free. My, children are debt -free. My children are debt free. My family's debt free. My, debt -free. My name has honor. I'm a, giver I'm a giver and not a taker. Not a taker. I'm, increasing I'm increasing and not decreasing. Not decreasing. I'm, above and not beneath. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm the head and not the tail. My name has honor. My, name has honor. My church has honor. My, church has honor. My, body is whole My body is whole and healed. And healed. I'm walking in supernatural health. I'm walking in supernatural health. If Jesus doesn't return, Jesus doesn't return. I got another 20, I got another 20 40, 40, 60, 60 80, good years. 80 good years in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm, the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm, above and not beneath. I'm finding money everywhere. I'm finding money everywhere. In my pockets. In my pockets. And clothes I didn't wear for 20 years. I'm finding money in my car, my home, my land, my taxes. Money is coming to me. Healing is coming to me. I command Satan to return to me sevenfold what's been stolen from me in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. 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 Now we have, just stay here, Kathy. We have um, in this basket, it's getting heavier and heavier, uh, full of prayer requests. And some of them that came in today, I didn't print out, but they're in there supernaturally. I'm going to pray for these. I'm going to pray for everyone that's at home watching. And the reason for praying for you, now if you need prayer, if it's in your finances, in your body, for your children, maybe your children need healing. Maybe you need healing in your job. 
Maybe you need to change jobs. Whatever you need prayer for. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe you're psychotic. Maybe you're bipolar. <laughs> maybe, you're, uh, maybe you're just not in a good way right now. Maybe you've been depressed for too long a period of time and you know it's wrong. I want to pray for you and I want you to know that God's going to free you right now. We're going to have another healing service next week. So I'm going to pray for you, for you at home. Those of you that are here don't have to do this, but for you at home and you are watching on television, watching live, go ahead and stand your feet if you can. And if you've got a part of your body you want healed, place your, one of your hands on that part of your body. The other should just stretch out your hand towards the TV set, towards the computer screen. And Father, I command these bodies to be healed. I command these lives to be restored. I command restoration, money, healing to come into these physical bodies right now in Jesus name. I command joy increasing to come to them. I command that they are full of sap in their old age in Jesus name and that they have restoration come in. I command that they are free from medications and drugs by the spirit of the Lord. I command that weaknesses leave their bodies. I command them to be forgiven right now in Jesus name of their iniquities and their sins. I command it done by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I thank you. And Father, I command every, all those prayer requests that are in here, I command you to meet them. You can read everyone all over again. Father God, I ask that you'd meet them right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. And if you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ before and you'd like to do that right now, just repeat these words out loud after Kathy and I right at home. Say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus come into my heart right now. Into my heart right now. And make me a new person. Make me a new person. A new creation. I don't want to be, I don't want to be that, old person that old person anymore. Thank you, Jesus, Thank you, Jesus for, dying on the cross for, me, for dying on the cross for me so that I don't have to die, have to die for all the things that I've done wrong. Things I've done wrong. In Jesus' name, Jesus name, amen and amen and amen. If you just made that decision for Jesus Christ or if you've just been watching us for a while, I want to send you this free little booklet, Is the Bible for Real? Write me here at David Gonzalez Ministries, P.O. Box 847, Lake Delton, Wisconsin, 59940, or email me at pastor at and we'll send that out to you right away. Well, we've been great having you watching us on television this here this morning, if that's how you're viewing us. And later on this morning, you can watch us live on our website. Go to our website, mountainfaith.org, and you can watch us a multitude of different ways, and you can see how you can do it. Just pick the one that's most convenient to you. And join us live later on this morning and get more of the Word of God and the power of God operating in your life. So this is Pastor David and Kathy Gonzalez saying, Press into God. And he'll press into you. And we'll see you again here next Sunday at the mountain. Amen.